Hello and welcome to the Sunshine Cathedral. The Sunshine Cathedral is a different kind of church where the past is past and the future has infinite possibilities. And with that, we invite you to come and worship with us here on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10.30 a.m. at 1480 Southwest 9th Avenue. Now, I invite you to come in and worship with us here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Our first reading today is from the book of Ephesians. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and source of all, who is above all and through all and in all. In these human words, God's voice is heard. From the wisdom of Florence Scovel Shin. If one asks for success and prepares for failure, one will get the situation one has prepared for. We have a wonderful illustration of this in the Bible relating to travelers in the desert. They consulted the prophet Elisha, who gave this astonishing message. Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain, yet make this valley full of ditches. One must prepare for the thing one has asked for, even when there isn't the slightest sign in, of it in sight. In these human words, God's voice is heard. God is with you. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to Jesus. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. This is the gospel, the good news. I'm glad to be focusing on this gospel story this morning, this well-known story. And yet, as much as we think we know it, there's always more to get out of it. But first, Ephesians. Ephesians, uh, <coughs> written by, we don't know who. We used to think Paul, but of the 13 books attributed to Paul, and sometimes 14, sometimes Hebrews get uh, lumped in with that, but we have no idea who wrote Hebrews either. Hebrew doesn't even uh, mention, doesn't even name anyone, so I don't know why we lumped that up with Paul. But of the 13 that are attributed to Paul, Paul only really wrote seven of them, and Ephesians probably isn't in that number. And so the writer of Ephesians, whoever that person was, uh, however, makes a very good point. That writer reminds us that there is one source of all, one source. We, of course, have lots of names for the source. We create lots of mythologies about the source. We have lots of rituals uh, to, to connect with the source, and we all think that our rituals and names and mythologies are better than everyone else's. And yet, really, there's just the one, one source of all that is. There is one spirit, the writer says, and that spirit is the stuff from which creation is made, the clay, as it were, from which life is sculpted. The one life is expressed in and through and as every life. The writer says the one universal source is above all and through all and in all. And we see that thought illustrated in the gospel story. A large crowd has uh, gathered hoping to hear Jesus teach about the community, the family, the kingdom of God, the anti-empire, where all people are affirmed as the children of God. That was a compelling message, and it still is. 
And so there's a large crowd gathered, sort of a, like a kind of a drag event at the Sunshine Cathedral, a large crowd gathering. And the crowd that day, those people weren't miles from home at supper time, hoping to hear about an afterlife country club. And they weren't there try, as, as darkness approaches, at, as, as hungry and tired and far away from home. They weren't there trying to hear that their enemies were not going to be allowed into the afterlife country club. And they weren't there to hear that they were God's favorites and everyone else was destined for a divine kick in the keister. And it's good that they didn't want to hear that because Jesus never said those things. No, they were there to hear that sickness and poverty and oppression and grief and injustice and hardship or any other disaster or difficulty couldn't define them. That no matter what was happening to or around them, they remained part of the one source, the perfect source that is above and through and in all. And if they could feed on such a positive and empowering word, then they could face whatever difficulties, whatever changes or chances popped up in life. Many of the stories in Scripture are the product of creative imaginations. And some of the details of this story are probably not factual, but the story itself may have been considered one of the most important events attributed to Jesus' ministry. You see, the story is rare in that it appears in all four of our Gospels. Jesus' birth only appears in two. But this story shows up in all four. Only Matthew and Luke, writing decades after Jesus' death and almost a century after his birth, even mention Jesus' infancy. If not for their two brief stories, it wouldn't even pop up on the scriptural radar. We make a big deal of it. We love Christmas. But it's not a major focus of Scripture. Tithing, healing, including the marginalized, even opposition to religious zealotry are all mentioned dozens of times each. But Jesus' birth is barely mentioned, and then only twice, and not until long after he's dead. His ministry, not his nativity, is the focus of the earliest Jesus movements. But the story of Jesus taking a little bit of food and somehow making it stretch to feed thousands of people, that story appears in every gospel that made it into our canon of Scripture. And there are three, story, three points to that story that I want to highlight today. One, we are never totally alone. We're never really alone. Two, generosity is generative. And three, brokenness is it meant to be the end of our story? But let's start with that first point, that we're never really alone. In 1 Kings, the book of 1 Kings in the, in the uh, Hebrew Bible, Elijah, the prophet Elijah, is fed by ravens. Now, ravens just bring him bread to sustain him during a difficult time. And so here he is in need of food, and ravens just bring him bread. Now, how exactly are the ravens getting the bread? Are they stealing it from some poor soul who also needs it? I mean, where are they getting this bread? If a raven goes into a supermarket or a bakery to buy bread, doesn't someone notice that that's sort of out of the ordinary? And where does a raven keep the money to buy the bread? Do, do, do ravens carry purses, I wonder? Well, raven is probably a mistranslation. The text may mean to say that Bedouins, apparently it's very close to the uh, word revenue. It may mean to say that Bedouins, nomadic travelers, noticed Elijah in need and provided the prophet bread. And this makes sense to me, as it is a well-known fact that Bedouins are better bakers of bread than birds are. And so here are Bedouins, just people, helping out other people in need. It really isn't about the ravens. It's about the bread, about the sign and symbol that in this moment of isolation, Elijah isn't really alone. There was a comforting presence available to him even during a difficult time. And that presence nudged others to show kindness, but even if that wasn't there, the comforting presence would still be there, that one source that is over and through and in all. Wandering in the wilderness, Moses and his people see some flaky stuff on the ground. 
sort of like snow, but it's in the desert, so they know it's not snow. And uh, Moses and his people, they, they, they see the stuff, and they call it manna. Manna literally means, what's that? What is it? That's what it means. They're hungry. And someone notices some flaky stuff on the ground and says, what the heck is that? And someone else says, I don't know, but I'm hungry enough to see if it's edible. And it was sweet when they tasted it. But the problem is it wouldn't keep long, just for a day or two. But the good news is that it, keep, it kept showing up. It was compared to bread, bread that somehow fell from heaven. I once saw a cartoon about people looking up and, and the manna falling from the sky and they're opening their mouths like you catch snowflakes on your tongue and they're just grabbing the manna out of the air and there's also a bird flying by. <laughs> and one guy says to another, that wasn't manna. <laughs> but, you know, when you're hungry. So, they're hungry, they notice this stuff, they try it, it's sweet, and it keeps coming. But in reality... What that manna was was probably uh, a plant or insect secretion. But whatever it was, the people who found it useful in a moment of need took it to mean that, that they were not alone in their difficulty. That even when things seem almost impossible, there is still a comforting presence. In the Passover meal, unleavened bread is shared. It reminds us of the time of the Exodus when people had to be ready to leave at a moment's notice so they wouldn't add yeast to the bread because there might not be time for it to rise. They needed to be able to leave the moment the opportunity presented itself. The unleavened bread that could be snatched up and taken on a journey to liberation was a reminder that divine justice does not want anyone to be oppressed. The sign of divine benevolence is a reminder that we are never alone. And even in a silly childhood song, we are reminded of the connection and the healing that bread represents. You remember the song, Mama's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mama's little baby loves shortening bread. Mama's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mama's little baby loves shortening bread. Three little children lying in a bed. Two were sick and the other most dead. Sent for the doctor, the doctor said, Give those children some shortening bread. Mama's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mama's little baby loves shortening bread. Mama's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mama's little baby loves shortening bread. Well, you know the song. And so, <coughs> bread, bread, this sign and symbol that there is something available to us at all times, a comforting presence. In the book of 2 Kings, someone brings the prophet Elisha, Elijah's disciple. Someone brings the prophet Elisha some bread, and the prophet says to that person, give it to the people so they can eat. And the person with a few loaves of bread says, I didn't bring enough to feed 100 people. And Elisha says, do it anyway. Give it to them. And that person does. <clears throat> and afterwards, there was bread left over. That is the story that Mark is retelling. Mark knows the story of Elisha saying, take what you have and use it to help the community. And even if it doesn't seem enough, if you're faithful to it, it will somehow work out. Churches have said for generations now, and it remains true, and it's based on these kinds of stories. They've said, the good news is there is enough money in this congregation to do all the ministry we feel called to do. The bad news is it's still in your pockets and purses. <laughs> and that's what Eli Elisha is saying, and that's what Jesus is saying. It's like, I know you're scared there's not enough, but if we will start putting it into action, we will find that it's more than enough. Elisha feeds a multitude with limited resources, and Jesus feeds a multitude with limited resources. It's the same story. It's a retelling of that old story. And the story isn't, look how magical Elisha and Jesus are, that they can make bread stretch ridiculously far. The story is, the spirit of life is always raising people up among us to remind us of our sacred value, a sacred value that circumstances and situations cannot take away. And as we respond to that message, we discover that we are never alone. And because we are never alone, we can do amazing things to help the human family. And we can live ourselves with more hope and more joy in this world. 
Well, that we are never alone is point one, and I promised you three, so here are the other two. The second point is that generosity is generative. If this story happened at all, and frankly I have doubts since it is clearly a retelling of an older story, but it is possible that that older story could have inspired action. And that action may have proved to be so effective that every gospel writer needed to write about it. Maybe Jesus remembered the story of Elisha in 2 Kings and decided to put it into practice, and once again, it proved to work. The standard liberal Protestant interpretation of Jesus' multiplication miracle is that it was a miracle of sharing. People would not have taken long journeys on foot without carrying at least a snack. Figs, dates, wine, water, bread, nuts, smoked meat, something. But it wouldn't have been enough for others, not for a crowd, and really might not, not have even been quite enough for the person who had packed the few goodies, just so that they wouldn't wind up <clears throat> in trouble along the way. And yet, when Jesus, who has only a few rolls and fish to split between him and his 12 companions, starts to share what he has, limited though it seems, with the people, with the crowd, then one by one, people let go of their scarcity mentality and start sharing what they have. And when everyone gives what they can, it proves to be more than enough. Generosity is generative. When we push past our own scarcity thinking, we discover the source above, through, and in all is a source of endless supply. By participating in the flow of divine supply, we experience more of life. We discover that our sharing generates something powerful and positive in our own experience of life. As A Course in Miracles teaches, giving and receiving are one in truth. And the third point I want to make is that they had baskets of broken pieces left over. Yes, they were healed of their false sense of separation. They learned they were connected to a larger community, to a higher purpose, <clears throat> and to the very source and substance of life. They were not alone. And yes, they discovered that we live in an abundant universe, and we can best tap into that abundance by participating in it with our own generosity. But they also had broken pieces left over, which the disciples gathered up. In my book, Healing Prayers for Depression, I wrote this reflection. In the story of Jesus feeding a multitude, he had his disciples gather up the fragments of what was left. May the Lord of my life, goddess of my being, help me gather up any fragments of myself that I have left somewhere so that I may reintegrate all parts into a renewed, healthy, and joyful whole. If you are feeling, for any reason, broken or fragmented, that does not have to be the end of your story. These broken pieces can be gathered up and woven together into the perfect wholeness that is yours by divine right. Whatever you are facing today, whatever twists and turns lie ahead for you on life's journey, please always remember these three things. You are not alone. Divine love is with and within you. You have something to share, and as you share, you'll find gifts in life you never even knew were there. And even in those times that you feel broken or fragmented, that is not your truth. It may be your experience, but it isn't who you are. Those fragments can be collected and your innate wholeness can be expressed even still. We are never really alone. Generosity is generative and brokenness is not how your story is meant to end. And this is the good news. Amen. <clears throat> Do you need to remember that you're not alone? Sometimes loneliness, that's the worst. That is the most demonic experience. We just feel isolated, cut off, separated. It's a lie, of course, but the feeling is so overwhelming. The experience is there. Even though it's not our truth, it is what we were experiencing in the moment. And we just need to be reminded that it isn't true, that we are never alone. We are part of a family, a human family that has billions of people in it. Who could be alone? And that we are part of a cosmos with billions and billions and billions of stars and constellations and planets and, and chemicals and starlight and stardust. We're never really alone. And the source of all of that, <laughs> we could never possibly be 